Hello, folks. Can we get my presentation up? Is that possible, please? Thank you very much. Ah, oh, it is a pleasure to speak here in Ghent. I, uh, I've kept an apartment in Ghent uh, for the last two years or so. I moved my uh, company, I co-founded here to Ghent, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak here, as always. Today, I'm here to talk a little bit about machine intelligence. And it's something that's changing our entire world. And to understand it, it really helps to start with human intelligence itself. We think of the brain as one big piece, right? One big smart blob of smart jelly. And yet it's, in fact, created out of many different components that evolved at different times in our evolutionary history. There's a theory called dual process theory that illustrates that we have two main ways of thinking, a fast way and a slow way. The fast way is about intuition, creativity, flow, things that we do almost without thinking. And sometimes if we think about them too much, we find them difficult to do. System two, is about slow thinking. It's about things which are purely procedural, which are rule-based, like grammar and mathematics. We find system two generally requires more effort, right, than system one. And that's why we created computers to help us do these sorts of complex calculations. Now, Daniel Kahneman, the, one of the proponents of this theory, recognizes that system one, the fast way of thinking, is how we create models of the world around us and how it operates. The problem is that if machines lack system one thinking, then they lack the ability to generate new assumptions about the world around them. Machines can do all sorts of calculations, but they can't go into someone's kitchen and make a cup of tea. Until recently, now something is changing. Just in the past couple of years, we've developed some fascinating new capabilities that enable computers to be able to process information in a much more dynamic, much more organic, kind of random, stochastic way that before was never possible, or at least was not efficient. Machines are today able to reconstruct the world and knowledge within it from a series of curves called gradients. And this is, in fact, how the human brain functions also. Each of us has six layers in the back of our brains, in the visual cortex. And these reconstruct information from tiny little pieces upwards. Now, we created technologies like convolutional neural networks to analyze visual information. And when we did, we discovered from visualizing the processes that they solved the same problems in the same ways, reconstructing information about the world from tiny little textons like this through layers of edge detection and segmentation, then finally adding in texture and color. And having done so, creating a cohesive object and giving it a label and declaring something to be a dog or a frog. And today, the more sophisticated systems can in fact recognize what's going on in an entire scene, not just objects, but the context of an image. We can apply these technologies directly to commercial efforts, to selling things. For example, we can pinpoint um, fashion, for example, within certain photographs, or in this example on the right with Pinterest. This is part of the Pinterest app. You can select something you find interesting, like this lampshade, and it will give you objects which are broadly similar that you can then purchase. But why are we experiencing these new capabilities now and not 10 years ago or 10 years into our future? What's so special about this very time that we live in? 
Partly, it's because of the power of graphical processing technology that has developed over the last 20 years or so, and which has continually accelerated. And that has been partly driven by things like blockchain and cryptocurrency calculations in the past couple of years. That's half the battle. We now have much more distributed parallel processing capabilities than we used to. But it's only half the answer for, for why this is happening now. It turns out that data really, really matters. Whenever you press a button on your phone and talk to Siri or Cortana, or Alexa, for that matter, the algorithms that enable you to do this might have been created 20 or 25 years ago. But it's only once the data becomes available that these algorithms end up being deployed. If you think about it, this makes sense. Even a very intelligent brain is only as useful as the experiences that it has to draw upon. And thankfully, we have a lot. From the dawn of human history, right up until the year 2000, every human who ever lived around the world, in total, created five exabytes of information, about five billion gigabytes. That's a huge amount. And yet, thanks to the power of information technology, the capabilities of machines processing information, or even generating new information, the same amount of info data was being created roughly every 10 hours by the year 2010. And in our time, it's now doubling roughly every two minutes. We have a tsunami of data at our disposal, and it is this that is providing rich experiences for machine intelligence to draw upon. Just about anything that a human brain can do in one second or so of processing power can now be replicated by machines. It's so what do human brains do in one second? We might recognize a person, or transcribe between text and speech, or between languages. We might make an aesthetic decision about whether something is interesting or worth taking another look at. We can string a bunch of these different one-second episodes together, and we can pilot a vehicle, or we can note a series of data points and make an inference or a prediction about what's going to happen next. All of these capabilities can now be granted to machines, and in many areas, they are already superhuman. In the 19th century, we harnessed the power of boiling water, and we used this to create turbines to drive factories and to cross the oceans in great liners. And to these turbines, we harnessed dynamos, and that brought in the electric age. And at first, we only used it for heating and for lighting. It took us a while to realize we could also do things like manipulate radio waves. This has, in turn, led to the creation of a new utility that now we get to enjoy, this form of intuitive intelligence. And that's how I want you to think about it, as a new utility that can be tapped into by anyone. And it's no mistake, it's no accident that the companies with the greatest market cap and the biggest brands are the ones who have had the first mover advantage in using this new utility. It's no longer oil companies and sugar water companies anymore. It's companies that leverage the power of machine intelligence. We can also use these capabilities to revolutionize how we solve problems. By specifying a problem, and for example, the maximum amount of weight or cost or the desired structural strength, we can invite machine intelligence to generate solutions for us, and we can choose the best one. We can use similar techniques to transfer the style from one object or one aesthetic by one artist to a very simple sketch, like something you might create in Microsoft Paint. And now, if we want to, any one of us can be a Louis Vuitton. If we can conceptualize it in our brains, machines can help us to spit it out onto a page, even live, even tiny little adjustments, all of it becoming richer, enhanced by machines. 
And so the role of human beings is changing a little. We might move from being creators to being curators, those that decide what is worth sharing or preserving or mashing up with other things. Kind of like breeding little memes, in a sense. And our relationships with machines are going to get a lot more smaller and more intimate as well. Machine intelligence is now becoming very small and very powerful and can be embedded just about anywhere. It means that the paradigm of computing is shifting. Distributed autonomous systems like Bitcoin, the Bitcoin hashing network, there is more power in this hashing network than the top 500 supercomputers in the world times a thousand. It is a vast net of computation, and it requires more energy to run than the entire nation of Slovenia. Computation doesn't really look like this big iron in some server farm anymore. It's shifting. It's now starting to look more like this, an ecosystem of little intelligences all interacting with each other. Take a look at this worm, the C. elegans worm, studied in labs as a model organism all across the world. It's a very simple creature with only 302 neurons. That makes it perfect for replicating in silicon. Here, a virtual model organism reconstructed every tiny little component. And we can take this, this little organism which can live inside a web browser, and we can give it an embodiment, a physical form, and it can go out into the world, looking for food, bumping into things, doing its wormy thing. And why would it believe it's anything but a worm? These sorts of little, simple intelligences are going to be found in just about everything, embedded within little devices connected to, for example, our washing machines, or even embedded in our clothing as wearables. Soon, these sorts of small distributed intelligences are going to be found everywhere. And with it comes a new form of connection to economics, something called the machine payable web. This idea where machines help to decide what we should be buying, and who from, and how to get the best deal. If you think about it, rich people in the old days had butlers and estate managers to help them with these sorts of minutia of life. And machines are going to help us to make these same decisions. And if machines are making more of the commercial decisions in our lives, it may make sense to market to machines more than human beings, in a sense. And that might seem crazy, but we already do this with search engine optimization. We have content on the web, which is for human beings, but we encode it in ways that machines can understand also, so we can connect the right content with the right people. And we're going to have something like search engine optimization for products and services soon. In the first layer of the web, search was the paradigm in Google, or the chiefs of that domain. And in the second layer of the web, it was social and peer-to-peer, -peer, and Facebook are the chiefs there. There's a third layer, an economic layer, which is emerging. And we don't know who's going to win this one yet, but it's possibly going to be Amazon. They seem to be the best contender at the moment. I think we might see a fourth layer at some point something to do with a sort of psychosocial layer coming. As our interactions with machines become more intimate, and we find machine intelligence embedded in all kinds of things we might not expect, like this Barbie doll, Hello Barbie, sort of like a Barbie Siri or child can talk to, or we might start to find it embedded within 
Things like this robot pet, $99 robot cat for elderly relatives, created by Joy for All, a division of Hasbro. A simple device at the moment, but soon going to be embedded with quite sophisticated intelligence that can tell whether your elderly relative has had a fall, that sort of thing. Machines are going to be observing us all of the time. Even autonomous systems, autonomous vehicles, for example. Today, the Google Street View car comes through your neighborhood once or twice a year, as soon it's going to be several times a minute. As machines perceive us at our best and at our worst, they can start to generate quite sophisticated profiles of who we are and our behavior. And it's possible for machines to even get hints of things like our sexuality, for example, or even things like whether we have certain conditions, like autism or um, even early onset Alzheimer's. These are things that can be detected just by listening to a conversation or by observing from a standard camera. I think machines are going to get very sophisticated at knowing how we tick. And I think we have an opportunity to use this. I'd like to show you the current state of the art in machines understanding and responding to human needs. My kids keep me going. What advice would you have given yourself 10 or 20 years ago? Um, to, uh, to not believe, uh, to, to, to not be so gullible, to not be so gullible. Mm -hmm. So this is Sim Sensei. It's created by a department within the US Navy for veterans. And you'll see that it's analyzing her facial expressions, how she's leaning in, the motions of her breath, how she talks, the prosody of her speech, the inflections, as well as the content, and then generating meaningful responses based upon this. I think this is a vision of where we're going next after this economic layer, into this Web 4.0, if you will, psychosocial layer. You know, the greatest killer in our society isn't automobiles or heart disease. It's actually loneliness. People have fewer friends that they can rely on these days than ever. We've gone from three or four close friends in the 1980s down to one or zero today, on average. And if we find things like the opioid crisis going on in many parts of the world, we know that society in many places is not so healthy. I think we have an opportunity for machines to help improve our lives and to provide reasonably meaningful connection that otherwise might not be possible. You might say that it would be better for people to connect with human beings than machines, and I would be inclined to agree. But perfect is the enemy of good, and I think this is better. Technology is the thing that makes scarce things abundant. And I think there is an opportunity for technology to help make an abundance of connection with others. But for this slightly utopian idea to come true and to bear fruit, we need to learn the lessons of the past, don't we? We don't want machines that are annoying. We don't want machines that frustrate us, that get in the way, or even worse, are slightly creepy. This is not a solution, and this is not a future that I would like to see. I'm sure you are the same. And there are many challenges for us to face in the years to come. A lot of these more advanced forms of machine intelligence based on deep neural networks are what is described as a black box. It's difficult to know how they came to a certain decision or what kinds of biases might have been made in making that decision or in that prediction. 
This is something that a lot of very bright people are working to try and mitigate, but it's not easy. Furthermore, we're living in a world where increasingly intelligent machines are lying to us. And these lies have very strong effects on our society. Estimates that emission scandals could cost tens of thousands of lives. But they're statistical lives, they're not the sorts of ones you see on the evening news. So they're easy to forget about in the short term. And you may be called up on the telephone by a system that tries to sell you insurance. And it's using voice lines recorded from a human, but the playback is controlled by machine. And you may get a funny feeling in your gut and ask, are you a human being? And it will say, yes, of course I'm a human being. This problem is only getting more and more tricky, especially online. Only about 50% of traffic on the web is from human beings. The rest is bots. Some of them benign and help, you know, helpful or harmless, but many of them are quite malicious and naughty bots. Many of them, for example, impersonating human beings and leaving fake reviews or sowing mistrust in our society. And in a world where anything can be counterfeited, this becomes quite a significant social issue. So, how do we stop naughty machines from getting the best of us or shaping our society in ways we would prefer it didn't? I think we have opportunities. One in particular is this new field of engineering and philosophy combined called machine ethics, where we can specify rules, good rules, for machines to help better understand how they can make the most of a situation or how they can act which are more preferable to human expectations. Remember how I said that data matters? This lady, Fei Fei Li, is a professor at Stanford. And back around 2008 or so, she created a data set for machine intelligence, particularly vision-based systems, called ImageNet. And her creation of this data set enabled a very rapid increase in the power and capability of vision systems. I am part of a group creating a data set for machine ethics. It's called OpenEth, O-P-E-N-E-T-H dot org. And our plan is to invite people from all around the world as a public forum to help specify the, fe the field and the space of ethics. We're teaching machines the same way that you and I learned when we would visit our grandparents and we would be told myths and legends, sagas and fairy tales. And in those stories were embedded moral lessons, the moral of the story, right? Whenever you go to the library, there are non-fiction and fiction books. And the non-fiction books are for facts. And the fiction books are, I believe, for values. That's how we sustain culture. That's how we create and share shared narratives that enable modern civilization. It's my belief that perhaps the next trillion dollar economy is the kindness economy. If we can all come together to create something like a human heart for the cold and distant machine. Thank you. Nel Watson, dames en heren.